Hi, everyone. Yep. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. I'm really excited about this guest today. I'm really excited because not only has she been on twice, but she has so much more to share with us today. She shares with us how she went to two different places in heaven again. One is the glory chamber and the other is the wine cellar. And when you hear about the wine cellar, you're going to be surprised of where the wine came from. Because when I heard where the wine came from, my jaw dropped. Ivan Atia, thanks so much for being with us again. Jenny, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on again. You're so welcome. So welcome. So since the last time you've come on, um, a lot of things have happened. And you're like, Jennifer, I really want to share with you about the glory chamber and the wine cellar. But you want to focus on the glory chamber first, because this is more intimate. Tell us, what is the glory chamber? Sure. Well, I tell you what, Jenny, um, I've been in the healing ministry for a very long time. And it's really hard when people are not healed. You know, you have all those amazing promises in God. God's word. You have promises like Mark 16, where it says that believers are meant to lay their hands on the sick and see them heal or recover. So a lot of believers, they come to the table and they're like, hey, I have this condition and you pray for them. And when they don't get healed, many questions begin to get asked. And sometimes people think, why doesn't God want to heal me? They just think that God is sitting there in heaven. They have this image and he is seeing me in so much pain and he can press a button and heal me, but somehow he doesn't really do it. So it comes with a lot of anger, frustration, and then offense. Well, this sort of was a bit of my story because what actually happened was in 1998, this is the year I got married and uh, I was driving back from work. I was actually, I started my life working in a child care center. So um, I was a trained school teacher, but I wasn't, I was still in my last year of university. So I worked in a child care and I was driving back home. And as I was driving on real high speed, the car that was right in front of me without any indication lost control. And this car began spinning. And I had absolutely no time to do anything, no options. So I smashed into the score. And before I even realized what had happened, four cars behind me crashed into me. So I was right in the middle and that crash of those cars coming in obviously hurt my body a lot. Now, at the time that this happened to me, I didn't even know if I was like, you know, dead or alive. You're in so much shock that you're just sitting there. And so I, you know, the ambulance came, my husband came, they tried to get me out of the car and uh, I was able to walk, but I did f- figure out two things happened to me. The first one is that the seatbelt locked really, really strong. And so I had a huge bruise here, but that wasn't the issue. The main issue was I couldn't walk straight and I I knew there's something wrong. And so I went to get checked out and the doctor said this to me. She said that the tailbone, which is the last part in the spine has been crushed because of the impact. And it's almost like it's, you know, when the bones are so crushed, not into one area, but it just becomes into so many different areas. She said to me, the doctor said this to me, we can't put you in plaster. We can't do anything to you. And it's not like it's an arm or a leg. And I was like, okay, what's going to happen? And she told me the the worst news anyone really goes, you know, you go to the doctor not to hear this news. But she said to me, unfortunately, you will live for the rest of your life with painkillers. And even now, Jenny, as I'm releasing those words, I'm just canceling. I'm canceling in the spiritual dimension every negative word that was uttered over God's people. If you're sick and you're hearing me now and you went to the doctor, you have a chronic condition and you heard those words, you know, medicine, I'm not against medicine, but it's limited. 
And so in the medical dictionary, there is nothing that can be done for you. But we know of a God who does the impossible. At that time, no one preached me. No one told me the good news that I'm sharing with you right now. I literally absorbed it. I believed that I ended up living my life in pain. And not just that, Jenny, I called it my pain. Like it, I so much identified with it as time went by because it's the length of time that just becomes terrible. So, you know, I, I had two children, but it was very hard to pick up my children. I was in pain to pick up a laundry basket. I was in pain to vacuum my house. And, and the thing is, it was like, you know, my pain. I called it my pain. And it was normal to just wake up in the morning and just take painkillers because I'm trying to get rid of my pain. And it was only temporary. It was only a couple of hours and the pain would hit back again. Um, going to sleep with a lot of pain. Turning as I sleep was a lot of pain. But then what do you do? You live with pain. Well, fast forward, years go by and I get to 2010 and I get filled in the Holy Spirit. Again, in my mind, our mind, we, you know, put everything in different compartments. So it was almost like, you know, God filled me with the spirit is one thing, but it doesn't mean God's going to heal me because as I did say to you in our last show, I didn't grow with healing. I didn't see that happen. And uh, so God broke into my world because at that time I was diagnosed with a skin condition and I had that for three years. And I remember going to doctor, same report again. It was like, hey, you have this virus in your skin. We don't know where you got it from, but there's just nothing that can be done for you. And uh, so God broke in that time and God miraculously healed me when I didn't ask him for it. So to me, my eyes were open to the ministry of healing. I, I saw Muslims get getting healed and that helped them become believers so my eyes were like wow god you know healing is a way of evangelism i want to press into this area so i started to go to school healing school i learned so much i started to study opened up our house praying for people we had someone healed of a thyroid cancer someone healed of pain like it was just every week we would like come over we're going to pray for the sick. And I remember we just really went out there. I remember on one occasion, and if someone watching me and you're new in ministry, you know, you're going to laugh because when you're new in ministry, Jenny, you do crazy things. We printed like 10,000 flyers in Sydney, Australia. And we were like, Jesus heals, just come and get prayed. Then we just send them randomly. And here I am thinking that God's going to bring 10,000 people. Well, we only have a couple of people turn up. And they're like, is this the healing meeting? And I'm like, is that all God? And God said to me, be faithful with them first and then I'll bless you. And I remember praying for those people. They get miraculously healed. And they're like, everyone needs to know about this. This is amazing. This is glorious. But my question to God was, okay, God, you healed my back. You're using me every single week on TV. We're reaching millions on, on television to the Muslim world. Um, you're healing all these people, but what about me? What about my back? I am finding it difficult to do a lot of things. And when you begin to be awakened on the inside of you, uh, Jenny, what used to be okay doesn't become okay anymore. And that's actually a good sign. I call it holy dissatisfaction. I used to be in a place where it was my pain. I'm going to live with it all the time. And I used to tell my friends, oh, there's nothing that can be done. But then your eyes are open thinking, hang on a second. If God is healing all these people, God, why are you not healing me? And so I was like, okay, I'm going to lay my hands and I'm going to rebuke this pain. It didn't go away. And I went to different healing meetings. I was like, I'm going to go to the preacher. I am believing that if you lay your hands on my lower back, I'm going to be healed. I wasn't healed. And I shared this story, Jenny. And a lot of the time, because I God called me to equip the body of Christ, I try and share the bad stories more than the good stories. Because if I want to equip someone, 
it's no good when I come and tell you all my glorious stories and you're thinking, but that's not what's happening in my life. But when I tell you the truth of the journey, then you're encouraged. And so I'm so discouraged. And offense begins to um, enter my heart. And this is the thing. In your spiritual journey with God, if you're not in a state of thankfulness and gratitude, you end up being in a state of entitlement. It all becomes about, you know, God, why aren't you healing me? Is this not my inheritance? Should I not be healed? Rather than looking and focusing on what is God is doing, I'm more focused on what God is not doing. And so without me realizing, my heart towards God was beginning to be hardened. And I was like, God, I really do not understand. You can heal me but you're choosing not to heal me because I am believing, I'm in faith, I'm doing everything I'm meant to be doing, but I'm not healed and I'm not happy as well. And I remember, Jenny, the Lord does something so beautiful. And, and, and I want you to know at that time, I'm doing every healing course possible. I mean, even teaching people on healing. But then there was something that I didn't know that God could do. And so the Lord, I, I, I'm in prayer. And I open up my Bible and I land on Psalm 37. And it says this, it says, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, I wasn't delighting in the Lord. I was coming into the Lord's presence saying, Lord, you, you need to heal me. Well, God doesn't need to do anything. And so I'm like, Lord, I'm delighting in you. I'm enjoying you and the Holy Spirit begins to remind me of a very intimate time in our when I was engaged to my husband. And I remember I grew up in a very strict family and my dad, he was very protective over me, very. Um, so during the time of our engagement, he would put a lot of unfair restrictions. Well, what I thought in my time, <laughs> you're, you're unfair dad, you know, it's like, what time are you going home? What are you doing? It got, it got too much. So I would call my fiance, who is now my husband of 25 years, but I would call him and I'll be like, you know, my dad's been so hard on me, but don't worry. When I see you, I'll tell you all about it. And so he would, we would go and we would choose like a place where there's like a river or somewhere, which is nice. And we would just fall in love with each other and completely forget how angry I was or upset I was about my dad. I'd go home and remember, I'm like, I can't believe I just met with him and I didn't tell him anything of what my dad did. And the Lord revealed it to me in prayer. The Lord's like, do you know why he never bothered? Because you were so in love. You focused on him. He focused on you. And I said, Lord, that's a sweet story. But why are you reminding me of that right now? Like, what is, what is it? And the Lord said to me, would you fall in love with me? Would you make the time that we're together about me and you? Would you minister your love to me? And just do not worry about what has not happened in your life yet. And I said, would you give me the grace to do that? Because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you begin to pray and you want to tell God what you're going through. And that's totally okay as well. But God's about to teach me something that would change the course of my life. So then here I am, Jenny, training myself, which is really difficult for me <laughs> to begin to pray and just not to ask for my back to be healed. It was like, here I am, Lord. I'm learning how to delight in you. I'm learning how to enjoy you for who you are and for what you have done for me. And the truth is, God, whether I do get healed or I don't get healed, the truth is you are my redeemer. You are my savior. You are my Lord. And that's not going to change anything. It will make life easier for me, but it just won't change anything. And so I just begin to focus on him and just love on him. And so I'm in my prayer closet. And all of a sudden, Jenny, I'm taken into a beautiful place. And when I mean a beautiful place, it looked like a castle. It looked like a glorious, glorious, glorious castle. It had white sandstone and they were shimmering. 
And I walked into this hallway and on the doorstep, I changed my clothing. I wasn't able to enter and it happened so quick. It wasn't like I was getting undressed and dressed. No, it was walking through this area and all of a sudden I'm wearing what seemed to me like a bridal gown. And it was so beautiful. It looked so hu huge, but it, it felt so light. So it wasn't like I'm wearing a 20 or 30 kilo dress. It was like I was wearing nothing. Yet I knew that I was wearing a beautiful garment. I continue to walk and I am immediately in the presence of the Lord himself. And I know that because, it, I mean, this encounter was actually one of the earlier ones, but I knew that because when you are in the Lord's presence, you know that you know that you know that you are. It's almost like your spirit knows that this is where it comes from. So it feels like you're home. It feels like you're at rest and you're in the place where you're meant to be. And so here I am in front of the Lord and just looking at him and all I could see, not just his eyes, but everything was love, everything, the way he looked at me, the way he just gazed at me, it was very deep love that is unknown to this world. The rays that were coming out of his eyes, it was penetrating my heart. And I just sat there and I just said to him, I just love you. I love you so much. And, I, I, and, and it was even hard for me to speak and say many words, but he knew he, there was a smile on my face. There was a smile on his face, but it was almost like two lovers that are so, so, so deep in love. And all they want to do is just exchange love, nothing else. And so I felt very um, heavy. And in a way, I was standing at the start of the encounter. I sat down and then I found myself that I was unable to sit. So without me realizing, I leaned back. And this is all during this prayer encounter. I'm on my back. And as I am on my back, his presence was covering me as if I was laying at the bottom of the sea. It was this presence that seemed to me like waves and waves of love. Many people, when I minister to them, they just tell me, Yvonne, there's so much love. I ministered to someone last week and she was going through a lot of rejection and a lot of stuff. And when I embraced her, she went to my husband and she said to him, today I hugged Jesus. And he was like, you what? And he said, Yes, because I hugged your wife and I had never felt the love that was in her. And my husband said to her, it's because she received this love through an encounter with the Lord. So this is that encounter where I'm on my back and those waves. And I mean that two things were happening at the same time. The first thing is that the wave seemed super heavy I want you to think about the sea you're at the bottom of the sea and all that pressure is on top of you so there was a part of me where I felt I was gonna die because of the heaviness of the presence but at the same time they were penetrating me gently one layer after another layer after another layer and I was weeping I knew that tears were just going through streaming because I was like I had never experienced the love like this and here I am thinking this is all about love and I am receiving it and I'm loving what the Lord's doing and so towards the end of the encounter I see up again and now I know that my time is and I'm ending this time and I am getting up and normally, normally, I won't just get up because of the pain. Normally, I would go on my knees first. I would support with my hands first, then push myself up. Well, I found myself just jumping up. And I was shocked. And this is where I froze. And I just looked and I said, Lord, did you just heal me? And I heard the Lord say, yes. And I said, Lord, I've been asking for this for many years. What happened? And he said to me, my love healed you. 
healing is in my love. And he said something to me, Jenny. He said, Yvonne, you're going to be so full of love. And when someone hugs you, they'll be healed. Ever wanted the experience of attending a genuine royal ball? Well, here's your chance. Join Deep Believer Ministries for one of the grandest, most powerful events ever to solely honor King Jesus with a night with the King at the Broadmoor. Enjoy the magnificent grounds, accommodations, and fine dining of the five-star, five-diamond, exquisite Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A night with the King at the Broadmoor is a very royal, very formal three days, two nights conference that will provide you with hands-on training for true, Christian, supernatural living by renowned teachers and evangelists. This includes training in multiple areas of healing, deliverance, spiritual warfare, how to walk out the abundant Christian life, as well as how to obtain success in finances God's way. Then, for the royal evening, Soak in the ambiance of white tablecloth gourmet dining, live brass and stringed instruments, acclaimed Christian singers and worshipers. And what's a royal ball without ballroom dancing? Don't know how? Complimentary ballroom dance lessons are included. A night with a king at the Broadmoor will be a night of complete honor and reverence to our King Jesus and will be like nothing you've possibly ever experienced. We hope to see you there for this stately, eventful night. Be healed. And he said to me, I want to give you a mandate for the body of Christ. Healing is in my love. It's not about renouncing a condition. It's not about rebuking a condition. That's great. But God is calling the body of Christ into a much higher realm where it is in his love. So I am beside myself. I'm thinking, am I healed? Am I thinking that I'm healed? So I'm trying to jump. I'm trying to do all the things I could not do. I'm telling you, Jenny, this happened in this encounter 10 years ago. I have never ever felt this pain. I can do everything to God be the glory without any sort of pain. So I was like, Lord, I need to, I was writing my book, revealing the healer. And I thought, I need to let the body of Christ know. And so I jump into scripture and I want to read just John 15, 7. It says this, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, we get to hear two conditions. Condition number one, if you remain in me. Condition number two, my word remains in you. The word is not just the word of God remaining in us. Jesus is the word. The beginning of John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word is God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So when he says, if you remain in me and my word, we need to say, and Jesus remains in you. In other words, the act of remaining is likened to the tree, the branches and the vine. Without it, there is no fruit. He said, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask for anything you want and it will be granted. And I was like, oh God, I was doing it the wrong way. Here I am thinking, Lord, I want the fruit. Healing is a fruit. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So I want the gift. Here I am. I want that. But the truth is when and I choose to remain in him and he remains in me, the fruit happens automatically. And the Lord began to show me the vine. And he said to me, okay, look at the branch and look at the vine. The branch is embedded in the vine. The branch doesn't wake up every morning thinking, I need grapes. I need grapes. It doesn't do that. It remains in the vine and what happened is you wake up one morning and you see the fruit and the lord said to me this is 
maturity. He's calling the body of Christ into a new level of maturity where our highest goal in life is not to be healed. I love healing and I'm going to be praying for those to, many to be healed today. So I don't want you to get me wrong, it's, but it's not about that. It's not about deliverance. It's not about what I can get from God. And when you get to see people dating each other, sometimes it can be, what is it? What, what is in this relationship for me? That's what the world thinks. What's in it for me? But that's not how God is calling the body, the new maturity. It's not about what's in it for me. No, God, I am in it for you. I am in it because of what you have done in my life. So he says, you remain in me and I remain in you. That's all you got to do. Your role in life is remaining. Jesus said this. He said that, you know, I want you to, to, to remain in me as I am in my, my father. He, he, in other words, that's, that's a, in, in the, the Greek translation, the word knowing, he goes, I even want you to know me in this way. That word is called yada. It is an intimate knowing. It is the same word that, that is used in the Old Testament where it says that, um, you know, that so many people, when they're about to have children, it says, for example, and um, Adam knew Eve. And she bore for him a son. So that new word is a yada knowing. It is an intimate knowing. And so as a result of that, fruitfulness takes place. John 15, 9, it says, I have loved you even as the father loved me. And then it says, remain in my love. Now, those words and those verses, I have learned after my encounter but remain in my love he said when you obey me you remain in my love as I obeyed my father's command and have remained in his love so Jenny I began to teach that healing is in his love it is great to rebuke sickness and disease it is wonderful to command it to go away but the Lord said this to me that if you would just release my love, my love will remove sickness and disease from so many different bodies. So here I am receiving all of this, writing all of this. Time goes by and I'm not teaching this. I'm just like, Lord, I need time. Because some people who haven't had those encounters, they're thinking, what is this woman going on about? You know, she's seeing God. She's sitting with God. He's a embracing her so I at the time I wasn't confident enough to be able to say yes I did and that is the inheritance of every believer you don't have to enter the heavenly realms when you die you can go there now because you are in union with Jesus and you do that by faith so a couple of you know years go by and here we are still having healing meetings and I haven't changed my ways. I'm still stuck to rebuking sickness and disease and all this stuff. And one day we were in a healing meeting. And I said, I want everyone who is sick to come up the front because we want to pray for them. So many people came and we were praying and God did amazing things. And uh, we ended the meeting. And as we're going home, I'm standing on the door just to say bye to everyone in the meeting. And this older lady she comes to me and she says, Yvonne, I'm so sick in my body. I'm so full of pain. And I said, why didn't you come up the front? I, I wanted to pray for you. And she said, I don't know. They didn't do this in my church. So I was just really shy. I was really embarrassed. Can you take me to a side room and pray for me separately? And I said, sure, not a problem. But let me give you a hug. And after, the, after everyone is gone, we'll go in and pray. And she said, yes, please. And so she gives me a big hug and I'm just embracing her. I had completely, Jenny, forgot what the Lord had said. I wrote it down, but I completely forgot. And so I'm just hugging her, telling her that I missed her, that I loved her. And she begins to weep. And I was like, what's going on? Are you okay? She said to me, the moment you hugged me, all the pain that I had for many, many, many years immediately left my body. And so, so I share this for the glory of God to bring mature believers into a maturity of faith. 
if you are sick in your body and you've been asking God, asking others to pray for you, I want to encourage you not to focus on the sickness or the disease. I want Psalm 37 to be your psalm, John 15 to be your place where you come into the Lord and just say, Lord, I love you and I receive your love. And be sure as the Lord releases this love that you will never, ever be the same. And so for ministers, it's not about just, so I really want to say this, Jenny, healing is not a formula. It's not a place where you write a formula and you say, okay, step number one, do this. Step number two, no, healing is from God and God is love. So when you connect to God, you connect to his nature, his character. He is Jehovah Rapha and he does everything out of his love. And so the moment we connect to that, you're connecting to God's deepest place of intimacy. And so another thing as well, which is really important, sometimes when people are not healed, they can get offended. But when you root them in the love of God, they'll never be offended. Sometimes we don't have the answers. Sometimes we see people dying after we pray for them and we don't understand. But that is why after the Apostle Paul shares about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, he comes to 1 Corinthians 13 and he talks about love. And he says that love is the highest expression. Love never fails. Everything else can fail. Everything else can be done in part, like prophecy, for example. But his love is absolute. It is unconditional. And when his love grabs a hold of your heart, then you will find your th yourself being so much in love, healed, saved, delivered. And not just that, but full of joy, full of hope in such a world that is desperate for love and for joy. We call that the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And why it's so important? Because gifts are free. And you can see someone who got just filled in the Holy Spirit and they're speaking in tongues. And we're thinking, wow, they're mature. No, they're not. The gifts are given to equip the body. But if you watch a mango tree, it takes seven years to bring out the first mango. In other words, when you operate out of the, of the fruit of the spirit, you are a mature believer. You are able to love whether you get healed or you don't. You were able to love whether what God has done for you happened or it hasn't happened. Your highest goal is to be a lover of Jesus and be his hands, feet, tongue, and minister that love to a world that is dying, that is desperate. That, in this, that is in despair. So towards the end of the show, Jenny, I'm going to pray for an impartation of the same love which I received in heavenly realms to come upon us so that we are operating and doing life out of love. Yvonne, that is amazing. Everything you just said was mind boggling, especially for those who are listening right now. I want to go back a little bit to the beginning when you said medicine is limited. So when you got into this car accident, your doctor basically told you you're gonna be on meds for the rest of your life. And like you said, medicine is limited, but I love how you said previously, just now, how you said that healing is not a formula and God's the one who does the work. Now, where, where was your mind when you prayed, right? And you did everything you're supposed to do that you believed to get the healing and you didn't get it. Were you offended? You just said some people get offended. Were you offended a little bit? Were you confused? Where was your mind at? I was, and I'll tell you why, Jenny. When I first learned, and I guess the beginning courses of healing that I had done are wonderful, but they were for beginners. So what I actually learned is that when someone's sick, you lay, you first of all invite the Holy Spirit, which is amazing. You then lay your hands on the area and then you commend the sickness to go. So it worked. And I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but in my mind, healing became a formula. It's when people come to me, okay, where is the pain oh it's here okay um and normally I would get people to forgive and try and break curses but 
It was all a formula. It was all do this first and then you do this first and then that should be the result. But what happened when you do all that? And that's not the result. And I just feel such grace in this show, Jenny. There's going to be so many thinking, okay, that's my condition. That is my condition. You know, I, I know people that are diagnosed with cancer and they've gone to doctors and they're like, okay, there's nothing else that we can do. They've tried medicine, tried medicine. Let me, this might shock some people. There are more people dying today from cancer than we had people dying 20 and 30 years ago. And you're thinking, but how? We should be so much more advanced in technology. But at the same time, there's so many different variants of cancer. There's so many. So at the end of the day, it's, and, and this is the thing. I am not against doctors and I'm not against medicine. Jesus himself wasn't against doctors. Jesus actually said that healthy people do not need a doctor, sick people do. In other words, if you're sick and you go to the doctor, that's totally okay. So I don't want you to feel guilty for doing that. In actual fact, God works through doctors. God works through everything. So let's not be you know, ignorant and put God in a box. No, but at the same time, we cannot take what the doctor said to be absolute truth and final. Because if you do that, then you are saying that the doctor is your God. And you hear that, Jenny, all the time. The doctor said, I'm sorry, but King Jesus said, I am sorry, but the name of Jesus is far above every other name that is invoked. I, 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 and, and this is the thing, I respect doctors, but I will never take what they said as the final decision over my life. And you're hearing this right now because there's death sentences that are being canceled in the realm of the spirit. Maybe you're suffering from something and you only you think you only have a couple of years to live. But God is saying, no, I am the ordainer of life. I am the life giver. I give abundant life. And Jenny, it took time for my mind to be renewed because you got to know that right at the beginning of my journey, I had no context of the Holy Spirit and healing. That wasn't even on the table. Even when God healed me from my skin condition, I never asked him because I just thought, you know, your spirit filled you speaking tongues and that's it. But I never related the two that if you are filled in the spirit, then Romans 8, 11 becomes your portion that the spirit which raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and it is able to give life to your mortal body. And so I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. It took me time. But even by the time I got around to knowing it, healing was a formula. Healing was like, okay, let's do this. You know, let's break generational curses. Let's break bloodline. Great. But that's not it. Anything that we receive right now, and sometimes when people watch me pray now, it's funny because it's not the traditional way. You know, it's just a time of intimacy. Sometimes I have to, what we call the prayer of silence. It's the prayer of just being fully in the spiritual realm, letting go and just letting the Holy Spirit do the talking, do the interceding, do everything. I'm just resting. I'm just watching. I'm just receiving. You know, sometimes I tell God, God, I'm sick of my own voice. I'm not coming into your, in the prayer room to tell you what I need. You already know what I need. You know, I'm just here to love on you. I'm here to receive from you. Lord, one day I said this to him, I'm here to look like you. So I'm not going to do much. I'm just going to sit there looking at you. Because I had read an article which basically said that when two people are married for a very long time, they start to look the same. And it's because they look at each other all the time and they mimic each other's, you know, actions. And when people see them, they think they're related. And I had that happen to me. So Mina, my husband, he's not related to me at all. But we've been together for a very long time. And a lot of people are like, are you guys like somehow related? Because like, you know, there's, and we, no, it's not. But we look at each other all the way. We're, we're in each other's faces all the time. So I said that to the Lord, I'm here to just indulge in who you are, to receive who you are, to just fall in love with you. And as I am doing that, you're doing everything else behind my back. You're healing me. You're delivering me. You're defending me. Jenny, I found out things that God was doing that I never prayed about because I didn't know that I was in danger. 
there was many things that were happening and I didn't know about them until later. But I knew that when they were happening, the Lord was defending me, lifting me up and I wasn't even aware of them. So therefore, I feel that so many people, the Lord is calling you into a higher level of maturity. It's not a, don't focus on what is not happening because I did that. I was like, you did not, you're not eating my back. And I remember once in prayer, I saw a whiteboard and there was one black dot. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Yvonne, what do you see? And I said, I see the black dot. And he said, really? You don't see the white screen? <laughs> you don't see the whole whiteboard? <laughs> you just see the black dot? <laughs> and the Lord said, shift. That was the word, shift. Don't see the black dot, but see everything else that I'm doing and let the white overtake that black because you are overcome with what God has done. You're so thankful to what God has done. One of the spiritual practices that I do now is that before I go to sleep, Jenny, I will sit and I will think about at least three things that the Lord has done in my day. Three things. And I am telling you, every day, it's a list. It's never three things. It's like, wow, you did this, Lord. And that happened, Lord. And that happened, Lord. Okay, now I'm going to rest in your arms and I sleep. And the Lord said, when you do this, you sleep in a position of gratitude. And what does gratitude do? You enter his gates with thanksgiving. So thanksgiving opens up the heavenly realms for me as I'm asleep because I entered into rest and I had so many people got healed, saved and delivered. Jenny, I wasn't planning to share this, but the Holy Spirit is reminding me. There was one time I went to bed and I said, Lord, use me as I am sleeping. I don't want to just go to sleep. I want to be used by you. And here I am. I fall asleep. And in my sleep, I enter into a jail cell. In this place was a very dark prison. It was so, so dark. And I said to the Lord, where is this place? He said to me, this is the execution chamber. And I was like, what? This is horrible, horrible. It's, I saw demons in there. I saw, it was just horrible. I can't even begin to explain it to you. But when I, when I went in, I saw this young boy. Well, he wasn't a boy. He was a young man. And he was about to be executed. His name was Muhammad. And I said to him, Muhammad, the Lord Jesus sent me to you to tell you that when you prayed the other day and you said, God, forgive me that you have been forgiven and that you're not going to hell. You're going to be right in the arms of Jesus. And he just collapsed. And he began to weep. And he said to me, this has been my prayer. I said, God, would you confirm it to me? I woke up in the morning and I had so much tears on my face. And I said to the Lord, what happened, Lord? He said, I just sent you to minister my love to Muhammad because I wanted him to know that I'm going to be waiting for him, that I'm going to be receiving him. And so when you are operating out of rest, out of love, even when you're asleep, the Lord is able to allow you to minister his love even to the darkest places where in the natural, no preacher can go, no minister can go. Who's going to go into the execution chamber? Who's going to do that? But in the spiritual realm, we can do that. Just like in the book of Acts, when that was happening to this man who was, you know, evangelized by Philip, exactly the same is happening now to those who dare to believe that God is able to use them, that God has given them his love. Wow. Ivan, that's huge. Now, when you saw this, he was a teenager, you said, right? Yeah, he was. He was a young man. So he would have been past his teenage years and he would have done something and he was about to be executed. But I was there and I just remember even embracing him and just letting him, just ministering the love of God to him. But what was amazing was towards the end, his facial features totally changed. He was so full of joy. He couldn't wait 
because he knew that God had heard his prayers, that God, that God is waiting for him. So he didn't care about what this world was, was going to do to him because at the end of the day, he knew that he was going to be um, in God's arms, but just ministering the love to him changed his countenance you know and the Lord, and when I woke up I said Lord was that a dream or did that actually happen and the Lord said this actually happened you were in a prison cell you said to, and I said Lord how did it that he said to me you delight in the Lord he gives you the desire of your heart you said to me before you go to bed can you use me while I am asleep I used you I have a lot of needs and I have a lot of places that people can go into. But in the realm of the spirit, there's no prisons. You walk into concrete walls. You walk. It's exactly this, Jenny. It is a foreshadow of the resurrected king. So when Jesus rose up from the dead with the resurrected body, the Bible says that while the doors were shut, he came in. And he said to them, peace be with you. The Lord is doing that to many people today who dare to believe. And I know that many will be watching this. Thank you, Lord. I want this to happen to me. Ask him. This is the time where you say, Lord, send me. Be the Isaiah, read the Isaiah prayer. Send me, Lord. Let him, him, let him know you're available. Send me to the prisons, God. Send me to the jail. Send me to, to the execution chambers, God. Send me to those who are in domestic violence. Send me to people behind bars. In the realm of the spirit, you have united, not just with Jesus, but with the resurrected Jesus. And he can go through shut doors. He can go through walls. He can go over mountains. And what is that, Jenny? It is the renewed mind of Christ. It is a renewed mind which gets you to believe all things are possible for those who believe. That is beautiful because that's what I was going to get at when I asked you if he was a teenager or not and whether this was real life or was it a dream. And you said it was real life. And it shows how the Lord doesn't work in a way that we think he works. He works in different dimensions, obviously, because he took you while you were in your sleep. And have you bless somebody else to give them encouragement to know that he's going to live and not die. I think that's pretty awesome. So Yvonne, there was a point where you said that you began to call it your pain. And do you think that that was a problem when you began to basically own it? So it was yours. When mm -hmm. did you begin to let that go and not call it your own anymore? Because you took ownership of it. Yeah. When I began to pray for, when I, when I entered into the ministry of healing, I began to think, hang on a second. This is not my pain. This is the devil's pain. And even today, Jenny, whenever we pray for people, they'll send us prayer needs and they'll say this, can you pray for my cancer? Can you pray for my, you know, so, and, and I tell you something, when you've had the condition for a very long time, you identify with it. It becomes part of your identity. I want you to think of the woman who had the issue of blood. We don't even know her name. What do we know her by? We know her by the woman who had the issue of blood because we, because she's had it for so long. The Bible says that she had it for like 12 years. So when we have a condition for a very long time, at the start, maybe you can go for healing prayers or you try different medications or you try a different doctor. But when nothing happens, you're like, okay, you own it. And what God is calling the body of Christ into right now is that on the cross, Jesus paid for your sickness and for your disease. First Peter 2, 24, it says that on the cross, he took upon himself that. And so by his stripes, you are healed. In other words, on the cross, Jesus paid for this cancer. Jesus paid for this blood condition. So we cannot come and say, you know, that this is mine. I remember, Jenny, I read this beautiful story, which I really loved, and it helped me identify that. It was about someone who had a lot of garbage in front of her house. And so she called the county, and she said to them, there's a lot of garbage, you need to come and pick it up. So they did. They picked it up. And then she said, how would you feel if the next day you wake up in the morning and the same garbage is dumped again at your doorstep? And I was like, 
you would call the county again and you would say, come pick it up. She said, so why are we not doing that as believers? When we know that sickness and disease, they do not belong in our bodies. They need to be removed. They need to be evicted because Jesus paid the price for our healing. Then why is it that we are allowing the sickness and the disease to be living in our bodies? And I began to learn that we are in charge of what lives in this body. This is the temple of the Lord. So if you're suffering from whatever disease or sickness, I've learned to say this, cancer, you're not welcome in this body. I do not identify with you. I do not have any soul ties or emotional attachments to you. You are to die. You are to shrivel in the name of Jesus. And the moment you do that, Jenny, you have separated you from the cancer or you from the condition. Rather than thinking, can you pray for my cancer? It's not your cancer. It's the devil's cancer and it's to go to him. So again, that is part of the renewal of the mind. So we need to grow up. The Bible says grow up as believers. And we do that through training our senses to recognize that Jesus paid for our physical condition. Why? What? So many people are like, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, let's be honest. If your body is sick, then you will not be able to complete your God-given calling. This is not, it, it's, it's, let's be honest. Think of the time even that if someone has cancer and they have to go on hospitals and they have to go on chemo and they have to, and then how are they preaching the gospel? So it does affect my God-given destiny. And so we've got to understand this, Jenny. When Jesus died on the cross, he died with his spirit, with his soul, and when he's, with his body. With his spirit to bring salvation to my spirit. With his soul to bring emotional healing to my mind, will, and emotions. And with his body to bring healing to my physical body. So your physical body has been purchased fully on the cross of Jesus. And you are not called to die young. You are called to die like Abraham and Isaac, full of days, full of glorious days. You're meant to say like Simon, the elderly in the in the temple he said this right now lord you can let your servant go because my eyes have seen your salvation i said to the lord i'm not going to leave this until i've written every book i've finished every degree that i want i want to minister to everyone you called for me and when i am empty i'm going empty because i don't want to go full god showed me so many people jenny they're going full they're going because they've aborted their destiny. They've stopped fighting for their health. And I'm going to come and say, Lord, right now you can take me because I've seen your salvations, God. I've seen the deliverances. I've seen the revivals. You've sent me to nations. I've healed the sick. I've raised the dead. And I am ready. And that is the renewal of the mind. Because you just think if someone dies, their time's up. No, you have a choice. Those people who go and, for example, you mean you can extend. People ask me, do you think even we can extend our lives? Well, you can definitely cut your life short by by doing things. You know, you think about people who smoke, for example, and they end up with lung cancer. Well, maybe if you didn't smoke, you wouldn't have died at this age. You know, or when a child dies and you get to hear Job being quoted, the Lord took, the Lord gave. Let the Lord's name be blessed. Hang on a second. Job repented from those words. Job said to the Lord, I didn't know you, God, when I said this. So we're still repeating times of what before Job's conversion. And we're still saying, you know, how is this mother meant to serve the Lord and be intimate with him when her heart is broken, when she sees all his friends graduate in college and she just feels, God, I don't know, but maybe you have a great need for my child. So many people, Jenny, because of ignorance, what happens is that we abort our destiny, the de destiny of our children. And the Lord is asking the body of Christ to step into his love. It is in this love where you will find purpose, destiny, where you will be healed and saved and delivered. You're not kids anymore. You're not babies who come to their mothers. You know, do this for me, mom. You know, you think about your girls when they were young. Mom, buy me this. Mom. And when you do, oh, I love you, mom. 
The truth is she loves mommy anyway. Whether you bought her or you didn't buy her, she still loves mommy and mommy loves her. It was never based on performance. And we've become, Jenny, a performance-based church. You go to church and it's all about performance. It's about, you know, how amazing the worship band performed and how amazing. No, 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 no. It needs to get back to Jesus. It needs to get back to basics. It needs to be his love. We do everything we do. We minister out of love. We're doing this show right now, me and you, for one simple reason, to draw believers into a deeper intimacy of love. It's not about anything else. If you are in his love, the apostle Paul said this in Romans 8. He loved the Lord so much. And he said this, what can separate me from the love of Christ? And I used to think, what can separate Paul from Jesus? No, no, no. The Lord said to me, no, it's the other way around. What can separate me from Jesus' love? Nothing. His love is so powerful that no angel, no demon, no sword, nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus that is towards me. The question is, would you accept his love? And you know, Jenny, so many people, if they grew up in abused families, they don't know how to receive love. When someone loves them, they think, what do you want from me? especially people that have gone through sexual abuse. It's like, oh, you're loving me because you're about to abuse me. So when they come to the table and you're telling them, Jesus loves you, period, they're like, what's in it? And they do not know there's a wall. And I'm just believing, Jenny, that as people are hearing this, the, the wall is going to come down because he doesn't want anything of, he, of you. He loves you, period. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you. The apostle Paul knew this. He said the God who loved me and gave himself up for me, he gave the cross the highest expression, we've just celebrated resurrection. And I was reminded of crucifixion. On the first Good Friday, no one was looking at Jesus on the cross thinking, wow, he died for my sins. Or that's the greatest act of love. No, they were horrified. They were confused. They were left in utter despair. They didn't know what that even meant until years later we get to receive the first epistle of Galatian. And the apostle Paul tells us that that cross is the son of God who loved me and he gave himself up for me on that cross. So I am just feeling the love of God, Jenny, being poured out into many hearts. Many are, you're being healed right now from an anxiety. You're being healed from rejection, from depression, 70% of physical conditions are a result of a psycho-emotional disease. And so the Lord is healing emotions right now. The Lord is restoring you as a son and as a daughter of the Most High King and bring, bringing you into the heavenly realms where you get to see the King with his glory. He's not in despair. He is seated on the right hand of the Father until he brings every enemy at his footstool. Amen. Wow. And Yvonne, I want to get to the wine cellar, but right before we get to the wine cellar, there are people watching who hears everything you're saying. They're excited right now. And they're like, I want to be like this, but I need to know two things that I really can't grasp onto. You mentioned earlier, you have to be intimate with God. What does that mean to be intimate? And then two, you said to remain. So could you just explain to them what does it mean to be intimate and what does it mean to remain in Christ? Amen. Let me begin with intimate. In John 15, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said to them something so beautiful. He said that I no longer treat you as slaves. I treat you as my beloveds in the original translation it is not friends it's beloveds and you're like okay god you're loving us jesus and he said this because i have disclosed to you everything my father told me so there's a key right there how do you become intimate you disclose everything to jesus in other words, you never come to the table with a closed heart. 
You never pray because you have to or because you're doing God a duty. No, you come to the table and you don't even say, I'm not going to tell him what I'm going through. He already knows. No, that's all lies which needs to be broken. You come to the table for one reason. You disclose. This is the thing, Jenny. My 23-year-old daughter, she's so beautiful. Her name is Esther. And she says to me, mom, I don't like small talks. And I was like, I never heard that. Like, that's a terminology that young people use. And I didn't know what I, what's a, I said to Esther, is there a big talk and a small talk? She's like, yeah. A big talk is a deep, intimate talk where your heart is opened and you are genuinely sharing your story. A small talk is when you are sitting with someone and it's a very superficial conversation about the weather and the latest sports. And I was like, wow, many believers are having small talks with the Lord. You know, it's like, thank you, Lord, for everything. God, would you protect us? Be with us. Thank you for your presence. In Jesus name. Amen. I'm sorry. That's a small talk. But when you come to the Lord, you undress. And I mean that. Undress is becoming naked. It, it is a place where you were created naked. You had no clothes on when God created you. So it's a place of saying, God, this is what I'm really going through. How do you become intimate? You just close. Jesus said to them this, I disclosed myself to you. I told you everything. I did not hide one thing. My father, whom I love so much, told me so much. And I said it all to you. Why? Because you're not slaves. A slave gets paid for their labor and they go home. But because you're my beloved, you can know everything. So how do we become? It is through disclosure. Honest, honest, honest disclosure where you open up to the Lord. And you say, Lord, and I say this, Jenny, if you grew up in a father who wasn't loving to you and you come later on and you meet Christ and someone says to you, you know, God is your father. You're thinking, oh, no, if he is anything, man, like my father, I don't want to know him. So I'm addressing everyone. I'm just saying that if you've had a hard father or an unloving father, can I tell you that Jesus is not like any father? And I say Jesus and God, you know, interchangeably because they are one. Christ is the exact representation of, of God. But God is not like your earthly father. God is not like your earthly mother. So we need to distinguish that because we're like, I never used to tell my father anything. You can't even trust this guy with anything. So when they come to pray and they're like, okay, they can't disclose anything because it's like, I don't trust my father. But when you come and say, okay, God is different. God genuinely loves me. He has, you know, my best intention in his heart. So then what happens is you open up. So it is when your heart is open, like even me and you, Jenny, we've become great friends. And when we talk to each other, I always have an open heart. The moment you have a closed heart with someone, that relationship, honestly, is not even worth having because it's a small talk. <laughs> it's what my daughter says. So that is the number one. The number two is how do you remain? You remain in him through his word and through the Holy Spirit. You know, so, so many believers, they just focus on the word. The word alone dries up. It dries you up if you're just word, 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 word. But, you know, the spirit alone puffs you up. But the word and the spirit, you grow up. So God is calling believers to grow up. What does that mean? You need to know the word. Why? When you know the word, you know the promises of God. You know your inheritance. You're like, hang on a second. I don't need to remain on painkillers for the rest of my life. My God is alive. He can heal me. He wants to heal me. How did I learn that? It was through his word. And then you have the Holy Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit, who intercedes for you, who embraces you, parakletos, he walks alongside, he prays for you, he guides you, he leads you. How do you do that? It is through the Holy Spirit. So it is through the Holy Spirit that you remain in God and you become, I mean, you know, Jenny, I live in Miami, South Florida, and we've had some 
horrible, horrible hurricanes. And we've seen some trees, they were like small trees, they were ripped apart. That we've had some big trees, nothing happened. Not one branch. Why? Because they are so embedded in each other, you cannot get them apart. And so you need to begin to say that, to, to pray that. I think it's in the book of Colossians where the apostle Paul says, let your roots grow deep in him. In other words, don't just be a superficial Christian. It's not about going to church on Sunday. It's not about going to church on Easter and Christmas. No, it's not. It's about being in the spirit every single day. The apostle John said, I was in the spirit in the day of the Lord. And all of a sudden he gets to see him heaven open and he is in front of Jesus. In other words, it didn't happen when he was not doing that so we need to be believers who are no, no compromise we need to be we need to grow we need to be committed to grow i once read statistics that said this jenny and it's shocking that 90 percent of christians over 90 percent of christians never put in the effort to renew their mind according to the word of god and that the majority of the, the, the Christian people, they don't pray for more than 10 minutes a day. If that, if that. So you're hearing me and you're like, Yvonne, I want what you have. I'm not leading you to works. I'm not saying that. But at the same time, Jesus prayed all night long. Jesus loved the Father. So we cannot be, I want it all, but I don't want anything. I love Bonhoeffer. He said this, grace is not free. I was like, what? I thought grace was free. He said, no, it's not. It's free to you, but it's costly because it costed God, his one and only son. So we can't be like, I'm receiving Living it all by faith. I'm not doing anything about it. I'm not coming into God's presence. I don't want to know anything about his word, but I want it all. It doesn't work like that. It's costly. It's going to cost you time. It's going to be sacrificing a lot of things for me to come and say every single day, you're the one and only. doesn't matter what I have. If I have you, I have everything. If I don't have you, I have nothing. It's as simple as that. So these are the two, Jenny, that we need to do. Disclosure and remaining. And the two together, you are creating a dynamite Christian. Yvonne, very well said. So let's get over to the wine cellar. This amazed me because when we were talking, you told me how, I mean, I know you're going to get to this eventually, how the wine looked. It didn't look like we typically see it here on earth. But um, could you tell us how you even got to the wine cellar in heaven? Because mind you, both of these uh, visions that you had, open visions, were actually in heaven. You were taken to heaven. So could you tell us how you got there with the wine cellar and what was the purpose of you actually going to this wine cellar? Amen. You know, Jenny, I, uh, before I share this experience, I just want to make it clear um, because as I share this, someone can think, have you been drinking the night before or something? No, I have not. So I am not against wine, but I haven't had wine since my ordination, like four years ago. So I have always learned something. Wherever you are in the realm of the spirit, Jenny, there's always a deeper place. And so I have always been pressing in for more. And so this was an ordinary day. And most of the time when I have those experiences, I'm not against any church conference, but that's not when they happen to me. It's on days when I least expect it. So I'm just, I, I, just a normal day. And I'm just sitting in prayer, loving on Jesus, because I learned now how to do that since this encounter happened in 2010. So just learned how to love on him and just in resting place, Lord, I'm, I'm so in love with you. And I said, Lord, I'm so thankful for everything that you have done in my life, but I just want more. There's a hunger for more, and I don't know what you want to show me today. And that was just me just saying that to the Lord. And before I even realized, um, Jenny, this is an encounter 
where you are instantly transported. So I've had encounters where there's a leading up to it. You know, there's a place where I just feel so, it's almost like um, a trance and I could feel the trance coming. Like I can feel that I'm entering into the trance. This one is not that. This one, I'm immediately in a trance. Like it's almost like you're just dropping. And I'm into this glorious place. And all I could see is a lot of fruit trees. And those fruit trees, like for example, I saw an apple tree and wine was actually being poured out from the actual apple. And that blew my mind because here on earth, that's not how we make wine. It, it doesn't work like that. But how can an apple tree bring out this wine? How can those uh, vines, there were so many different vines, but when you come to approach them, they were pouring out fresh wine. And not just that, I saw different color wine, which I had never seen here on earth. So one of the ones that really stood out to me was light purple like light light purple and it was so shimmering and so you're walking into this place this place is an open place it's got a lot of um trees that is around it beautiful trees and there's angels serving wine out of those goblets and I was like, wow, God, I felt a little bit like Peter, you know, in Peter's encounter in the book of Acts, when he saw the sheet with a lot of animals and he heard the voice telling him, kill and eat. He said, no, Lord, I don't do that. I felt a little bit like this because I haven't had wine for over four years. And here I am, I'm handed a glass of wine. It was not a small one. It was a big goblet. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, this is gorgeous. Like, uh, this is so clear. You can almost see through the glass. And I felt like saying, no, Lord, I haven't had wine for a very long time. But I could not, I could not do that. I, I literally took that. And as I began to drink, all of a sudden, my eyes were opened. It was a it was a deeper place of being alert. I was so alert. It was like Jenny, every cell in my body could see. It wasn't like here where you only see out of your eye, and if you close your eyes, then you don't see. It was so scary to the level that every part of me could see wherever. I sort of understood about the creatures in the book of Revelation, where it says that they were covered in eyes. You know, when you see them and or you see pictures of them, they look freaky because people draw them with eyes all over. So they look like monsters. But that's not what is meant by that. Every part of me could see. I could see through my eyes and my nose, my, my ears. I could see behind me. I, I, I am, and the thing is, right now I'm looking straight at you. I can only see you, but I can't see this way. I could see in every dimension. And as I continue to drink this wine, there was so much joy that was in every cell of my body. And so I'm seeing the Lord. He's drinking just like me. He's drinking this beautiful wine like me. But the thing is, the more I can't stop drink, I couldn't stop drinking. It's not like here where after one glass or two glass, you, you become drunk. No, I'm talking about a spiritual wine that makes you more alert, not drunk. So I wasn't feeling drunk. I was just like so alert, but so full of joy. It was a, it was a, a different realm of love. And I'm just looking at him and I'm just thinking, wow, Lord, you I've never seen this place. I used to think that a wine cellar would be dark. It would be a closed place. It would have all these barrels. It would have the bottles. I didn't see bottles. I didn't see barrels. All I saw was fruit, you know, pouring out fresh wine, different colors. I even saw light orange. I even, it was so many different colors. And so, 
I'm just like, I felt this approval from the Lord to drink. It was an approval to drink the spiritual wine, the wine of the Holy Spirit. And I am drinking. And as I am drinking, all of a sudden, I just feel like I want to rest. I just want to rest somewhere. I don't want to be standing up. So here I am, Jenny, looking around me that I need support. I just need to, you know, bend on something or lean on something. And so I'm looking around in this gorgeous garden and there's no chairs. There's no couches. There's nothing. It's just angels serving wine and the Lord in the midst of this. And so here I am looking everywhere for support. And when I don't see the support, I look directly in his eyes and I collapse in his arms. And as I'm collapsing in that beautiful place, I get to feel such an embrace and the Lord just patting my back like this. And I was like, I am in the best place anybody in this planet can wish to be. I never want this to finish. I never want this to end. I was just being so impressed and I felt so secure. I felt so protected. I felt that no one can get to me. No one can upset me. No one can hurt me. I was so safe in his arms. I felt like I'm never going to need anything, I'm never going to lack anything. I'm in a place of total rest and total love. And so the encounter took its toll. And there were things that I had not forgotten, but my memory cannot recall them any anymore. And so I'm trying to describe a spiritual encounter. So sometimes I don't even have the words to, to say what I saw. But I come to my senses again, that encounter is finished. And I'm thinking, Lord, I need to go to the word of God. If I am to share this with your people, I am not the type who would just share an experience because an experience without it being backed by scripture will lead people nowhere. And it's not about, oh, wow, Yvonne, this happened to Yvonne. No, this is an encounter to invite the body of Christ into those places. So here I am searching scripture and I didn't really see much. I didn't really find much until I come to Song of Song, chapter two. And it begins by this, Jenny, I'm going to read a couple of verses, but it begins that in verses one, you know, in actual fact, let me just go before that. In chapter one of Song of Songs, it is about a king called Solomon and a woman he fell in love and her name was Shulamiz. In other words, she is the feminine virgin of him. He falls in love with her and he begins to invite her into the chamber. And she falls in love with him. She comes into the chamber, Jenny, and she says to him, I'm black, but beautiful. A lot of people don't understand what that means. They don't understand that because she met the king, his glorious son burned everything in her that did not belong to him. So there is a change of her complexion. So being black is a state of glory. It is not a state of a lesser. In actual fact, let me show you this. It's, she says this because the divine love has looked upon me with his constant burning beams and changed my color. So when he changed her color, he changed it to black. Is that not amazing? Is that not glorious? And so... So many people think I'm black. In other words, you know, you know, I, I, that's not the state of glory. No, 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 no. It is actually the state of glory. She's saying to him that because you are my divine sunshine, because you're the son of righteousness, you burnt everything in me. And so you made me black because of that darker complexion. And he looks at her and he says to her, you are so beautiful. You are so beautiful. So then we come to chapter two. She's fallen in love with him. 
and she begins to discover her true identity. She says, I am the flower of the field and I am the lily of the valley. All of a sudden, she sees herself that she is now like the lily of the valley. In verses two, he speaks, the king speaks. He says, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters of Jerusalem. So he's looking at her and he's thinking, there's a lot of other, you know, um, lilies that they look like thorns to me, but you are the one who is standing out. And so in verses three, it says this, that they go together and they sit under an apple tree. It's says, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat under the shade of him whom I desire, and his fruit was so sweet. Now that shocked me right there, because I saw wine coming out of apples. And so she is in this place where she's actually sitting under an apple tree. I was reading for an early church mother and she wrote this, be not surprised then if I sit under his shadow and remain at rest under his protection. I'm only under the shadow of the wings of the one I love. So she's already in an intimate place. She's already sitting under the apple tree. She's sitting in his shade and she's falling in love with him, but she does not stop there. She is seeking to go deeper. And it is at that place, Jenny, it's Song of Song, chapter two, uh, uh, chapter two, verses four. It says this, when he saw the hunger in her, she's not satisfied to stay under the apple tree. He says to her, she says, he brought me into the wine cellars and he set love in order within me. And I was like, what? What did he do? In other words, the daughters of Jerusalem saw her intoxicated. They saw that she was just not herself. So they're asking her, where have you been? What did you drink? What is going on with you? So she had to confess. She's okay, I'm going to confess. First of all, we sat under the apple tree. That was good. There was shade there. I loved being with him, but I wanted more. And she says that to him in chapter one. She says, draw me closer and we will run. In other words, the cry of her heart is that I don't want to be under the apple tree. I want more. So this encounter is for those believers who are saying, thank you for the apple tree. Thank you for the conversion. But I want more. And so she's intoxicated and she's like, okay, I'm going to confess. We were under the apple tree, but he did move me into another place and they're like where were you and she's like well it was the divine wine cellar I went in this place and I was so intoxicated I lost it but I wasn't intoxicated because of being drunk he set love in order within me I was intoxicated by his love I lost it I couldn't do anything because of this love. And so this is, she said this to them. She said, you need to excuse me for my king has brought me into his wine cellars. And there in this place, he set things straight. And I was like, okay, God, this is crazy. So I'm reading a little bit more. And she is so intoxicated, Jenny, that in verses five, she says, strengthen me with flowers, strengthen me with apples. And it's like, are you beside yourself? You are in his presence and you are looking for external things to support you. Are you really serious? And so he picks her up and he says, she says, he's left hand is under my head and his right hand shall embrace me she got to know that when you're so intoxicated by love there is no other worldly support other than him 
ye need to collapse in his arms. If he is standing right in front of me, why am I looking for others to support me? Why am I looking for external things? So she's in his arms, his left hand, and I want you to think of this position, Jenny. If his left hand is under your head and his right hand is over you, where are you? You're completely embraced by him. And so she's intoxicated even more. And I call this this mystical slumber. I call this this holy or sacred rest. It is a beautiful place where God's calling the church to enter. And it is in this place where anxiety will leave you. You will be in a place of rest. And so what is so beautiful is he says this in, in verses 7. He says, do not awaken my love. In other words, it is a beautiful place where he is saying, you look so beautiful when you are resting in me more than when you're doing anything else for me. You are so beautiful when you're just collapsing in my arms and watching me embrace you more than when you're running around and trying to do this and trying to do that. And the Lord said this to me, it doesn't mean that the bride is not doing anything. It just means that whatever you do, you do out of that place. You do out of his embrace. You never let go of his embrace. Every external activity done without this embrace is completely useless. And the Lord is saying that so many people, when they first begin ministry, they have a lot of time with God and then they focus on the ministry. But as the ministry grows, what happens is a lot of people do it the other way around. Ministry takes most of their time and they give God just a little bit of time. And the Lord is speaking to even ministers today who will hear this and even ordinary believers. He's saying, can my left arm be under your head? And would you allow my right arm to embrace you? Become intoxicated with my love in my embrace and watch me grow your ministry. Watch me take you to another place. Watch me use you, heal the sick and raise the dead. Watch me do more in your rest than you would ever do when you're just running around on an empty tank. And so I began, Jenny, to understand that he, this is a beautiful place where God's calling us into the divine wine cellar. So many people, they're happy sitting under the tree, you know, and it's very limited how intimate you can get under an open tree. And here I am talking about spiritual mystic union, where you come into an intimate place with the Lord. You're completely in him, he's completely in you. And the journey of your life becomes you and him are one. That's what I do every day. I wake up in the morning and I decree that, Lord, you're in me. I'm in you. We've become one. And I go about my day as his left arm is behind me and right arm completely embraces me. That is beautiful. So you're, you found your rest in Jesus and he's embracing you. So there's, there's really... It basically goes with the Bible verse that God is for me. Who could be against me? You're just so sheltered in that. Yvonne, could you do me a favor and could you pray? Because I know you wanted to pray. I know you wanted to pray for healing and for rest Amen. and for others to uh, receive the love of Jesus, like you were saying earlier, to receive his love. So could you do that? Because there are so many who are sick right now who need healing and there are so many people who are exhausted, but not the exhaustion that we think. And then also people need to know the true love of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, let's do it, Jeannie. Wherever you are right now, if you're hearing all of this and you're thinking, I want all of this, it starts right there. Just lift up your hand and begin to invite the Holy Spirit. I want you to begin. I want you just to say, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit. Father, I just thank you. Holy Spirit, I welcome you right now into this. I welcome you, Lord, into every home, through every screen, God, through every person who is watching this, Lord. And they're saying, me, Lord, 
I just want to remind you right now, I heard the Lord say this, you have not been forgotten. You have not gone unnoticed. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, because by your stripes, we are healed. So Father, in the name of Jesus, as you taught me, God, in heavenly realms, that it is your love which brings healing and restoration. So right now, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus, oh God, that you would release right now, pour out your love even in the area of wounded hearts. And that's what I see. I see that the Lord is pouring out his love right now and the oil of the Holy Spirit into every wounded heart, into every heart which was betrayed, into every heart right now that is hurting. Holy Spirit, thank you. As this oil and the love of Jesus is being poured out Father, that they will feel a warmth in their body. I release your love now, right now, Father, into every organ, into their hearts. And Lord, I thank you that the presence of your Holy Spirit, that the presence of your genuine love right now is removing sickness and disease. You will begin to feel heat come all over you. There's people, you're feeling heat even on your face. You're heat, feeling heat even in your on your back. But the Lord is saying this, that my love right now, as it is being poured out, it is removing, removing even from the root sickness and disease. I see the Lord even canceling curses that are against you, cleansing your bloodline. This is all happening because there's a flow of his love right into your hearts right now. So just lift up your hands to the Lord and receive and say, Lord, this is me, God. This is me. I welcome your love in my heart. I welcome your love. And I, and, and I said this disclosure, open up. This is the time where you come to the table and you open up. Don't just say, this is another show don't just say i heard this before the lord says that today is a day of salvation today right now as you are hearing my voice come to the table and say lord i'm opening up i'm opening up and i hear the word trauma is leaving people's bodies the lord says this trauma is being removed right now from your body and I see the Lord pouring out this love. So, Father, I just thank you as you are even healing mental illnesses right now. Father, I thank you. Pour out your love even more. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. And I just ask for more. And, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that the heavenly realms are opened to those that are hungry right now. In the name of Jesus I open up your spiritual eyes, your spiritual ears, and even anything, remove everything that is hindering you. I come, and, I come and expose every lie of the enemy, every lie of religion that you had believed that this is only for saints, that you need to do certain works to get into those places, that, that there's unbelief in your heart and doubt. Father, in Jesus' name, I bind every demonic spirit of unbelief and doubt, and I silence those voices in their heads right now. And I thank you because you're opening up a way even in their minds right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I ask that even as they are uniting in this prayer, that the eyes of their understanding is open. And as I'm praying, I heard the Lord say, rebuke spiritual blindness. Father, in Jesus' name, I rebuke spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness and spiritual paralysis. And Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I move them, Father, into a new position to discover who they are in you and your love for them. In the name of Jesus, right now, I release you to enter into the heavenly realms. And I release an impartation right now for the love of God. Father, the same love that you brought into my body, God, as I lay on the bottom of this sea, God, those waves, layer after layer, right now, Lord, I activate them in your love. I activate them in your rest. 
Father, the sacred slumber, the sacred mystical rest, God. Right now, I release rest over your mind. Here it comes. You feel this coming all over you. Right now, receive rest is coming. You will be rested in him. Your heart is rested in him. Your mind is rested in him. Your emotions is rested in him. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, let the waves of love, the waves of your spirit embrace them, that they will begin to feel for the first time ever your left arm behind them and your right arm is embracing them, that they will do life out of this place of embrace and out of this place of rest that they will collapse in your arm and be fully intoxicated by your love. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit, that you are doing a spiritual operation right now, moving them, promoting them into a higher realm as mature believers to operate in love and live in divine rest. In the name of Jesus, amen. And amen and amen. Amen. Hey, did you feel that power? Because I felt that power. Yvonne, I mean, thank you over and over again. And then I feel as if every time you come, it gets better and better and better. The Holy Spirit <laughs> is just so manifested. Um, you know, every time you you preach and every time you teach, Holy Spirit just engulfs the okay. atmosphere. So I, I just want to thank you so much again for for teaching and training and just sharing your knowledge, not just your knowledge, your love for God. And through it, I'm sure everyone watching can tell that you have a love for people too. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on for the third time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And I know that God's taking you, the show, the ministry, the glory of God is upon you. The favor of God's upon you. And you watch what, I know God's already done a lot, but you watch and see what's coming as well. It's going to be amazing.